You're watching episode 33 of Beyond the Blast Wars, a Star Wars show and podcast here on YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm David Amelotti, one of your hosts. Joining with me, David Gilbert and Jesse Buck. And I think the episode this week, it's an episode of giving, and we'll explain that in just a, a minute here, but... First, we want to talk about what we're talking about in this episode, right? We're talking about uh, some news about Ryan Johnson's new trilogy. We have a hint of what Episode Nine could look like. Eight new Forces of Destiny episodes. Woo-hoo. And Hasbro, that Haslabs project that Jesse talked about a few weeks ago that we've been trying to give you updates on, we have another big update. We've actually mm-hmm. seen a video of the painting and the assembling of it. Mm-hmm. So you see why it's so much money, but it's just like, I don't know if it's really worth it. Um, before we dive into all those stories and more... We went down to St. Louis this past weekend. Dave and I went down to the fantasy shop in Maplewood. And you hear us talk about those guys and girls all the time because it's great customer service. It's a great selection of books on hand, both new comics, back issues. They have an incredible selection of board games and RPG models. Like, it'd be... Jesse, you really should come down with us because it's like it, it's uh, it's an awesome place. You guys always go when I'm working. Well, we'll <laughs> we'll try. I'll take a Sunday off and we'll go down there. He popped in when we went to Wizard World last month. That is true. Yeah. David was down there too. There. Yeah, I was yeah. completely completely drained though at that point. I think I sat at one of the tables while you guys browsed, which was funny because you were trying to sit down in your Mandalorian armor, right? No, no, that no, you were you were no, out of it. Yeah, I was out of it at that point. The point of bringing up that bringing this all up, aside from the fact that we got a really cool Thrawn number one variant, at least I did, is that we're really excited to announce that the Maplewood Fantasy Shop is the first official sponsor of Beyond the Blast Doors, and we want to give them a round of applause Yay! and show their appreciation. We're really excited to announce that starting next week on our show, we're going to be starting a weekly giveaway, and so it's your chance to win that week's comic. Uh, there's going to be anywhere from one to three Star Wars comics to come out. You win our, uh, you win the contest. You get to select which comic you want for free. Uh, I think there's a possibility of maybe sliding in a variant once in a while. Uh, how that weekly giveaway changes over time, well, we'll find out how that evolves together. But really excited for that. So be on the lookout. We're going to be doing some uh, promotional stuff with them and uh, giving them some love. And, of course, we'll have a couple fun giveaways and contests to where uh, we'll be encouraging you. If you're in the St. Louis area or if you're going through that area, we'll want you to stop in that shop and, and tell them hi. Tell them you found out about them through our show. So looking forward to seeing how that goes. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and we also want to say big Big thanks to our Patreon supporters. We are now up to three Patreon supporters, but our recent Thank you. Thank Chief you. Palpy donating at the twenty dollar level. So Chief Palpy, we'll Thank give you Chief. a round of applause. Appreciate the uh, goodwill, Chief Palpy. We know that you have a reputation around the galaxy, but you're turning over a new leaf, and we appreciate it. So with uh, all the thanks out of the way, you've probably also noticed that we have these packages on 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 the table. Uh, it is not Christmas in the Midwest. I know we do things differently, but it's not Christmas. But we have another uh, Patreon supporter and just fan of the show, John Boffman. David, you want to explain how this happened? Sure. Uh, John's actually leaving the tri-states. He's uh, going what? away to Florida. Um, I, he's not old enough to retire, but I presume that's what he's doing by moving down there. But he's a big fan of the show. We've got him turned on to other forms of Star Wars media, like the Star Wars Rebels, which he's now currently ahead of me in. So... Good job, John, making me look bad. Um, <laughs> but uh, as John's getting ready to move away, he wanted to say thanks for all the time that we've helped keep him entertained. Um, so he got us something as a as a goodbye present. Very cool. So, John, thank you so much for that. And, and thank you to everyone we've already mentioned, the Fantasy Shop crew, uh, John, Sheep Palpy, just really excited about it. We'll open up these gifts, I think, later on in FanCom. Like, John has a question in that segment that uh, we'll answer, and then we'll open the gifts and see what we got. Jesse's like... Super excited because, as he pointed out, I've got the biggest package. I, I know what Jesse has, and it's it's kind of what cool. is it? Yeah, it, like, you, like you it. clearly have the biggest package. I mean, on the table. Oh. Uh, we're going into real talk. I'm not even going to give you an opportunity to enjoy that joke. Real talk is a segment where we talk about everything that's on the screen. So that's movies, <laughs> that's TV shows. We're here to talk about it all, and we're so excited to have you here with us on episode 33 of Beyond the Blast Horse. First topic of the segment is Ryan Johnson and Ram Bergman, uh, Ron Bergman, I should say, confirms work has begun on the new trilogy. You might remember a few months ago, uh, oh man, was it even a few months ago we learned that Ryan Johnson was going to be able to write uh, a whole trilogy of new Star Wars stories. Completely blank canvas, if I recall. Yes. And he is going to plan, he plans to write all three, direct at least the first movie, which mm-hmm. I think is exciting. And we've said it before on the show that a clean, a, a clear palette for 
Ryan Johnson would be really intriguing to see. Um, <laughs> don't go off brand with our saga films, but have fun in a sandbox. <laughs> Guys, you know, you hear the story, and basically the report is, I think this happened. At, this, this did happen at the Empire Awards. Last Jedi kicked butt, five awards that night, mm-hmm. and they mentioned that work very early on, but work is underway for that new trilogy. So I guess this is officially pre-production. David, let's start with you. Your thoughts hearing this news. So I'm interested because I still want to see what they're going to do, where they're going to go. Are we going to get something back in the older public? Are we getting something in this modern universe? Do we get the Knights of Ren? There's so many directions they could take with us. Or are we just reaching out and creating something new? I think whatever we have, I think we need some more lightsabers in it because I think that's something that the fan base, myself included, would really, really love to see. Now, uh, preparing for the show, I went and checked out the IMDb for it. And I found it kind of interesting. Um, All three of the movies are already appearing on IMDb, and they have episode numbers to it. So is this going to be a new episodic feature of Star Wars? Because they're currently called Untitled Star Wars Trilogy, Episode 1, Episode 2, Episode 3. They might just be filler titles for right they, now. They could be. I can't imagine that would be. It's not. We know it's not connected to the Skywalker saga, so it's got to be its mm-hmm. own run. But it's interesting that they gave them episode titles as opposed to something different. Right, like Blue Milk or mm-hmm. Blue Har- Milk Harvest Blue, Blue or Harvest uh, Moon or whatever yeah. the hell they Is call it. Is it too it. late to mention? What? Blue well, Harvest. we'll circle Blue back yeah. to it. We'll circle back to it. Okay. Well, here's my question yeah. is what would allow this trilogy to be most successful as far as stylistic because we know that in the saga film that he did ryan johnson did a very ryan johnson movie for the last jedi and a lot of fans are upset because it maybe isn't it's not consistent with the previous films i heard recently someone referred to it as it was a little off brand for the saga films which i think is a fairly accurate description but you know if you take like a looper or you like a brick you know a, a previous style movie done by ryan johnson you do this blank canvas I think that could be really successful as long as he dials back the humor. Jesse, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, dial back the humor just a little bit. Uh, visually visually speaking, though, The Last Jedi was probably right up there, well, for me, uh, with Empire. Uh, simply because, I mean, just the locations they shot at. Um, as much as I didn't like the, the Canto Bite um, part of the movie because I didn't it just kind of feel like it was a gap filler in the story it this segment brought to you by Peta. uh visually uh it wasn't appealing you know um it was like Harry Potter episode nine. Uh, yeah but you, you know what I'm saying though like it, it was it visually it it did fit and you know like the cosmetics of the universe and everything see I would disagree um, with you because like my last joke I just made which is terrible I'll admit it but it felt like a Harry Potter movie like Canto Bite did not feel well, that, that, that's it didn't fine. feel part of the movie it didn't feel like anything you know, but I I don't know. I mean, visually, I think the movie was very, very much appealing. Um, I think uh, story-wise, the acceptance of what they did in, um, in 8 is still, it's going to take a while for the dust to settle and for the actual, I think, uh, fan verdict to, yeah. uh, to really... Uh, you know, settle in, settle in place. I'm excited to see how this video is received by fans like 20 years from now because I think the humor is really going to age it. Um, because of the pop culture references. Mm-hmm. Um, but here's what I'm really more curious right now is, what is this trilogy going to be about? Is this going to be focused on the Force? Because Ryan Johnson likes to play with the Force and see how he can kind of expand that lore. Could be about Porgs. Will it be a whole trilogy on <laughs> Porgs? <laughs> yes, please. It's just a Porg on screen you're just staring at for two hours. Take my money. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Do you- I, um, I brought my Porg with me today. You actually have a Porg? Yeah. Is that the Porg plush you're always talking about? Yeah, I brought my Porg today. Uh, can't touch it, it's mine. I thought there was a life-size one that you wanted so badly. Um, yes, but I have bills to pay. Okay. Well, tell me what kind of movie you want as far as like era with this trilogy. Where do you think it's going to take place? Are we going to get Clone Wars? Are we going to get a series of prequel Clone Wars movies here? I, ooh, I, I don't think we're getting Clone Wars because they did the, the animated series. Yeah, I, you know, honestly, I wouldn't want anybody else if they did do something like that. Filoni all the way. No, I, at the very minimal, Weiss and Benhoff. Mm-hmm. You know, because like I, I've, I've seen their work. I, I can trust them, kind of thing. Uh, Filoni on, like, uh, I mean, or John Johnson doing anything Clone Wars. Just don't touch it. I, I think Benioff and Weiss are going to be doing something with the Old Republic. I just, we just got to figure out if it's going to be this mm-hmm. TV show or if it's going to be the series of movies that they're working on. Um, I, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm going to stand by that. I don't want to go off on a tangent. Okay, so do we have any more thoughts about this? Because I thought you guys would be a little bit more excited to, to guess on where I, this thing is going to take place. I mean, I think I Unknown Regions. I want lightsabers. Give me lightsabers. I Give me something um, Old Republic. Give me something with the Great Sith War. Give me something where um, if it's going to be a prequel to what we already have on screen, give me uh, Plagueis with... Um, uh, a young Palpatine. Give me, uh, give me his fall and descent into the dark. It was a great James Lucino um, book until they retconned it. Um, I, here's my question, because a lot of people are talking about the Unknown Regions and exploring that in Ryan Johnson's new trilogy. But I would think of how they treated Snoke in 8 that Ryan Johnson would be not at all intrigued with the Unknown Regions. Is that a fair assumption, Jesse? That's a pretty fair assumption. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, well, fair enough. I, I think we had, there, there's a lot of other options on the table for better options to you know like certain categories you know to uh you know i don't know let other people uh, that's the whole point we don't know yeah i mean you do let us know down in the comments below make sure you let us know whether or not you're excited that this movie is in pre-production or let us know what area you think this movie will take place and it'll be exciting to find out i think we're a few years away so there's plenty of time to speculate next topic in real talk john boyega says episode nine will be an all-out war he's quoted by saying next up for me filming wise is star wars episode nine in july they've officially given us a note to start training soon i'm going to take a holiday before that because i think episode nine you know <laughs> regardless of where that story goes and i haven't read it by the way but it's going to be an all-out war so i know that i'm going to have to do all I can and train for that. John, I just hope that your character isn't sent away to Canto Bite and wasted for an entire two and a half hours. Uh, Jesse, let's start with you on this one. What are your reactions to John Boyega teasing that uh, episode nine will be an all out? Well, war? that's exciting to hear that it's going to be, you know, potentially action packed. Um, the comment, though, itself, I find funny because, like, he's like, I'm going to go on holiday first. What, what is a holiday for him? Is that going to the beach? Well, that's is that like binge loading on carbs. Yeah, I'm sitting here going, like, He's going to start training, which means he's not going to be able to eat all like the good fatty foods that we all love. So is he going to be sitting at a Chinese buffet shoveling ice cream and pizza? Yeah, I'm just mouth? like picturing John Boega like hitting up every possible like food buffet like and on this out at the Golden Corral. <laughs> <laughs> well, keep in mind, though, that he just got done. Like, Pacific Rim is now in theaters, mm-hmm. uh, which is not going over very well if you look at the box office. Um, but, you know, the guy has been busy. It, it, he hasn't been sitting on his hands. I think he actually was also doing theater for a little while. He was doing a stage performance. So the guy really hasn't slowed down uh, from Episode 8. And remember, they went straight into shooting Episode 8 after Episode 7. I mean, there wasn't really much of a break in between those two those two films so this probably is his one opportunity to get his breath underway because they start shooting here in a couple of months. So I, I like to think that John again is gonna gorge himself on all. So the you just want foods. a fatty John Boyega? I mean, like that's fine. Like if that's what's <laughs> if that's really exciting for you, I thought you guys would be like, oh my god, it's gonna be so much better than episode eight as far as like a war goes. Because like that's how John Boyega I mean, teased episode yeah, eight. Yeah, I mean like because episode eight he teased as an all-out war. And now here's episode nine, an all-out war. And my thing is, I'm fine with two back-to-back war movies because that's kind of what we got. But I would like more of an actual war and not just a ship outrunning another ship. And I like to actually see Finn have more of a role with the Resistance and maybe actually joining the the Resistance. I mean, at the end of the day, I always get excited for Boyega's interviews because he's such a Star Wars fan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So regardless of what he says, what he teases us with, I'm going to be excited about it because if he's passionate about it, I feel I can get passionate about I, it too. Yeah, exactly. I have to agree with David on this because mm-hmm. it's just anytime they've interviewed him, he's just always been very passionate about the role. Uh, one of my favorite things, like he was like, I got to tell my dad I get to hold a lightsaber kind of thing. You know, it was, he was mm-hmm. like so like thrilled about that. Did you see the video where he's seeing the uh, uh, the Force Awakens for the first time, like the finished product, and then like the lightsaber, you know, up in, when they're in the forest, <laughs> and uh, he like flips backwards over the couch and like is so excited. I'm gonna have to check that out. If- yeah, that was the uh, that was his first time watching the trailer for Force Awakens. Tra- it was a trailer. A trailer, yeah, okay. okay. I, I haven't years. seen. It. I know that's kind of like old news, but I mean, like, but it was, it was like so back fun to back. Watch. He is a very passionate individual. Daisy uh, cried on when she watched it for the first time. Yeah, uh, you know, and you have to give credit to all the actors. At least, at the very least, all these individuals, all these new characters, are very passionate about the roles that they're playing. Um, 
And I think that's a very good thing. Mm-hmm. Well, let's go on to the next topic. If you have any thoughts watching at home or maybe you're watching at work or maybe you're just in your car listening, let us know in the comments down below what you think about John Boyega teasing an all-out war in Episode 9. Next story we have, Mark Hamill talks about how he'd like Luke Skywalker to return in Star Wars Episode 9. His feelings would be if Luke did not return. Um, you know, there's been a lot of footage out with Mark Hamill recently in light of The Last Jedi on home release and digital release. Um, you have the, the director and the Jedi. You have a, a, a GMA interview with, with Hamill. Um, he has, you know, this story that's kind of making rounds where he's talking about um, if he comes back in nine as a Force ghost, he'd like to be a scary Force ghost. He'd like to expand the lore there because so far what we've gotten is, you know, Force ghosts who stand there and sit on logs, and now they can summon, you know, lightning from the sky. Mm -hmm. But you never see a ghost come back and and be terrifying. And I think back to what was said at the end of Last Jedi, and I am intrigued, David, that, you know, if you strike me down in anger or whatever the Mm -hmm. line is, you know, I will always be with you, Kylo, or I'll Mm -hmm. always be with you, Ben. It would be kind of cool to see a Force ghost come to a dark side user. I mean, that would be something Mm -hmm. we haven't seen. And so when you kind of look at the lore behind this, we know that Qui-Gon started learning this skill, and he can talk, but he can't manifest himself. And really, the only ones that can manifest are Anakin and uh, Yoda and Obi-Wan, and now presumably Luke, too. So, you know, Yoda's not the kind of guy who's just going to go wreck your world and, you know, make you pee your pants in the middle of the night. And I don't think Ben would be either, and I don't think the redeemed Anakin would. But Luke's got a chip on his shoulder. So I could see Mm. him coming back and, you know, mentally torturing. I would want to say it's not possible, but the the fact is is that Luke was at peace when he became one with the Force Mm -hmm. at the end of uh, The Last Jedi. So I don't really see him coming back with potentially a chip on his shoulder. I do think it would be cool if, like, yeah, he did appear to, you know, to Ben or Kylo Ren and, you know, just kind of give him some crap, kind of like how Yoda kind of showed up and, you know, gave Luke some, like, you know, a little bit of crap and everything. But I would love for it to be an opportunity to get more flashbacks. Mm -hmm. Like, what if it was a thing where... Luke is able to tap into Kylo in his sleep, and now the dream world is able to be affected, yeah. and you're able to see more. Um, you know, Ben, let me take you back to the past. Remember this moment. Remember when I failed you, or remember when you failed yourself. Mm-hmm. That would be pretty interesting. I think that would be an, another expansion of the understanding of our Force. The things that that we know is that Ray took the books, mm-hmm. those page turners. Um, <laughs> so things to what expect, lines in that movie. expect yep. to see, and. Uh, the next movie is, you know, that Ray is going to be kind of really f- kind of harnessing in her abilities. Obviously, she's going to have to rebuild a lightsaber uh, at some point. Maybe this is when we're going to get that that staff lightsaber I that want we were it. all wanting. Double yeah. ended lightsaber. So, My question is, what color would it be? Well, I'm assuming since the she still has the crystal for, you know, and everything, it would be blue. That that would be my theory on that. Blue. But, uh, blue. Blue. Yep. Okay. All right. I want it to be blue too, but there are some people calling for yellow, and I just don't think it would. Uh, make she sense. looks good with yellow. She looks good with blue. It looks. She looks good with blue. Um, uh, always down for some new saber. Yeah. Uh, some saber colors. I, I do want to read a couple of quotes here that we got from Luke, um, saying, "Quote. I mean, let's use the word ghost. That implies that it's frightening. <laughs> uh, but all things considered, especially when I thought that we would never come back at all. You know, I have nothing to complain about. So he's talking about again." Um, if they ask him to come back, yes, he would come back, but he thinks that his story is done. And he's clearly annoyed in the documentary, in the sound. Like, he is still, you know, I thought I would have a beginning, middle, and end in this trilogy, and I just have a beginning and an end. So it, I like Salty Mark Hamill. It's kind of fun. <laughs> um, so whether or not I'm in it or not in it at all, I'm fine with nine. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Mark Hamill. If you want to see Mark Hamill back, in episode nine, whether that's alive, maybe somehow JJ is able to keep him alive, or maybe he's just one with the force and he's a. I, if he's a force ghost, I want to see him behind Ray while she's using the force to assemble the lightsaber. I feel like that would be a really powerful moment in Star Wars lore. Well, I like I like to th- think that she's gonna have like a really like, for some reason in my head I picture like she's having this struggle or this emotional doubt moment, and that's where I feel like he's gonna pop up, mm-hmm. kind of like how like. You know, Luke was struggling in Empire, and then Obi Wan showed up. You know, on him, kind of thing. Like, I can roll with that. You know, that's what I would like to see. I would love to see Mark Hamill return, um, at the very minimal, as a Force Ghost in the next movie, um, just to offer some guidance or some hope. Uh, How to for, make for a new lightsaber? Or yeah, that'd be kind of a neat scene to watch. 
Yeah, because you know they did cut that out of uh, Return of the Jedi, like right, so kind of finishing. Probably the there, one so. deleted scene in all of Star Wars that actually should have stayed in there. Uh, let's go to the next topic. Let us know what you think. We want to know. Oh boy. Next topic: IGN talks about Frank Oz on Yoda's return in Star Wars: <laughs> The Last Jedi and the character's future. Uh, we have a quote here. We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, but just first, initial reaction because. You get in this article, Jesse, the joy of Frank Oz returning to do Yoda, but you also get honesty from Frank Oz saying, this is the last time you'll see Puppet Yoda. That if if they bring him back in 9 or a future movie, that essentially they have to go CGI because it's so much effort to learn the, the words and to mimic it with the puppet, and also the fact that four people are required to operate Yoda. What do you think about all this? Um, You know, this is the thing. I mean, obviously there was... a uh a lot of theories prior to the last Jedi is is that Yoda like because like they were looking at like a rock ship is that Yoda on standing on a rock kind of thing and you know and it's just like it's a rock dude, <laughs> um, but then you know you got to the uh, what was it the the premiere or whatever uh, and Frank Oz was there mm-hmm. you know kind of thing it's just like well why I mean yeah Frank Oz is kind of a popular I mean he's worked on tons of films and everything but. Mm-hmm. I think that was when people realized, okay, he's had some sort of involvement, you know, in this. Um, so, I mean, obviously, seeing the movie for the first time, that moment when we get that kind of that... Best scene in the film. Yeah. I mean, it was just like... But, I mean... Then let's, real, let's dive into what we're talking about right here, which is his reaction to that character. Yeah. He had doubts about it. I mean, mm-hmm. you read this article... Um, and you know that the last time that they did a puppet Yoda was for the Phantom Menace, and it was did not absolutely, well. yeah, it did not go well. Um, they didn't use the original molds or anything, and it was poorly, uh, poorly received. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me in this article, and even they, they kind of reference this in the, uh, the documentary on the bonus futures, um, so they're digging through the Lucasfilm archives, and no, this is a mold for, you know, the Phantom Menace Yoda. And they get down to the very bottom of the pile, and they find this 37-year-old mold for for Yoda. And that's when Jesse's cosplay erection just yeah, pretty much like. <laughs> but I mean, like they show a picture of it. I mean, you can definitely tell, you know, um, it's old. It's old. It has, <laughs> it well, yeah, look good. You know, it hasn't aged well and everything. Uh, and I've, I'd actually be curious to see uh, what they did to uh, resurrect that mold or save that mold. Um, you know, or replicate it to, to get it to that point. I like what he brings up, and David, just to bring this to you, we talk about the better ways that the new movies connect the canon. We talk about ways that not so much. This is a situation with bringing in Yoda to episode nine. It was done so well. The humor was on point. Mm-hmm. Yep. The lesson to, to Mark and the audience, the lesson to Luke, Luke and the audience, was so on point as well. This was a great behind the scene look at this is what we want. We want a new adventure, we want familiar faces, mm-hmm. but we want connectivity. And this gave it. I mean, this is it, especially for me because my introduction to Star Wars was when I was in second grade watching The Empire Strikes Back. I wasn't even really watching it. I was opening presents because I was like 7, and I look up and I see this little puppet Yoda on the screen and I grew fascinated with him and I sat there with my cousin Brian watching Star Wars for the rest of the night. That was my introduction. So Yoda has a very near and dear place to my heart. And seeing Puppet Yoda again was great. And uh, our friends over at who was the Star Wars News Net, when they kind of compiled all this information yeah. from a few different articles, um, one of the things that really came out to me was that um, they had support for Muppet Yoda over CGI Yoda all the way from Kathleen Kennedy all the way down to the effects department that had to put these things together. And so to me, that just shows that they're they're looking out for the fans. They want to recreate that original experience. And to me, it, it, it just it felt Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, really did. yeah. I mean, one of the most touching mm-hmm. scenes in the bonuses was mm-hmm. when they're filming this and, you know, Mark Hamill sitting along the sides as Frank is working the puppet. Mm-hmm. You know, Mark Hamill's getting super emotional about it because, I mean, he hasn't seen, you know, this in it's, years, mm-hmm. you know, like and it's just years. like... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, th- that really, yeah. I'd say that's probably the best mm-hmm. uh, fan tip of the hat to, to old and school fans in The Last Jedi was the Yoda sequence. And yeah. Neil Scanlon, who's the Lucasfilm special effects guy, he even says that it had to be a puppet and it had to be high class, I guess kind of making fun of uh, Phantom Menace Yoda, um, and he considered it a gift for the fans. So thank you. We appreciate Thank you, that. yeah. I mean, just... I mean, this was a fantastic article to read and mm-hmm. and everything. And the, I was really excited about. Like, I couldn't like 
as a prop maker and everything, just knowing that they actually save this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, because in the past a lot of it's gotten lost, you know, just oh, being thrown are we away. Able to and... show the picture of the uh, gross thirty-five year old oh, Yoda. Yeah, we, we can show totally the photo. Do that. We'll pull the photo up right now, and, and while we're doing that, uh, just thirty-seven year old, thirty-seven year old. Mm -hmm. um, I I, I want to echo what you said, Jesse, because I think you're right. I mean, that's that's a great bone to throw to the, the OT fans, and uh, for a real moment, you really did feel like you were not in that theater, that you were there on Act 2 with Luke and with Yoda, and you know what I love is the excitement that that he had to come back. Frank Oz uh, said, quote, several years ago I had lunch with Ryan Johnson, and Ryan asked if I could do Yoda in the next Star Wars, and I said, sure, because I thought it was just CGI, and then Lucasfilm president Kathleen Kennedy calls, who I've known for quite a while, who's fantastic. She called me about it, and then I realized that it wasn't CG, that it was actually the character, and I said, Kathy, do you have any idea what's going to happen there? It, this is tough. And she said, that's okay, let's do it, so you know, the workshop made him and everything, did a fantastic job. Um, Oz would continue, I'll, I'll get to that in, in a little bit, but I love the excitement and the shock value because, I'm going to be honest, I was one of the, I like C.G. Yoda from especially Revenge of the Sith. I thought uh, C.G. Yoda worked very well there. I didn't I, have a problem with it. I only liked C.G. Yoda in Attack of the Clones, unpopular opinion, I know, <laughs> because that scene in the cave is just so cool. When he's dueling um, with Dooku. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that, I have no use for a C.G.I. Yoda. You know, he did go on later to say um, that he doesn't know anything about Episode Nine, but he says it will be a puppet. Believe me, that's way too difficult for me. I rehearsed a long time just to do one line of dialogue as a puppeteer. It would have to be CGI. It would have to be. It's far, far too difficult because I'm doing it with three other people. So it's four people, and you just can't swing it. You have to study every single word with four people, and that's right because they have to coordinate. They have to know the inflection and the position of the of the the puppet to mm -hmm. deliver the emotion, and it's a testament to that craft of puppeteering, mm -hmm. and it, it makes you a lot more appreciative that there are folks that are still trained and adapt to that skill set because I think a lot of movies just rely on, oh, it's a, it's a creature or it's a this, we'll just CGI it. Uh, it puppets, they, puppeteering still has a vital role, I think, in filmmaking here in 2018. Yeah, yeah, I'm curious because, you know, like Andy Circus, you know, and Golem and everything, the, uh, the motion capture and everything. That seems like that's like the next level, right? Yeah, like mm -hmm. I kind of like, I'm curious of where... If this could cross over more simply because, you know, if they could somehow make it easier, uh, I would love to actually rather, I would rather see the puppet uh, return over CGI because mm -hmm. um, it just, it, practical props always look better when, when done correctly. So if they're able to figure out how to maybe capture the emotion. Okay. Uh, and then make it because you know Frank is is not a, he's not a young fellow anymore. So no. you know this is, this is not a, it's not easy for him. He is a little older. Oh, you know, Frank. Uh, Frank has to be at least in his early seventies, late sixties. Yeah, so like I'm sitting there thinking like if they're able to maybe capture if he's able to you know give the emotion mm -hmm. like the facial and everything they can use the motion capture to capture that at the very least and then let the puppeteers figure it out and they can put the voice to the you know no i wouldn't want that i think are either, you sure yeah like, i'm 100 I mean, sure if it can be done well like no because well i don't think it can be done well i think you got to either do 100 percent puppet or you need to do 100 percent cgi, CGI. yeah okay. I, yeah i think matching it would be it would it would honestly look like superman's mustache let's go ahead to the next topic here <laughs> in real talk which is season two of forces and destiny we get the first eight See, uh, episodes mm. of this season and you get hasty departure Sabine and Hera steal an imperial ship an unexpected company Ahsoka sees Anakin and Padme and a spark between the two shuttle shock which is Rose and Finn oh my god was that rough Jin's mm. trade which is a kid steals the the kyber crystal necklace that from was, Jin I didn't like that one either run Ray run uh, Bounty Hunted, The Path Ahead, which was very special. I'm sure we'll touch upon that. Mm -hmm. And Porg Problems. Gentlemen, we have, we have eight episodes of Forces of Destiny. How I don't think we need to go episode by episode, but uh, you know what? Give me your favorite moment and tell me the episode. Honestly, the only one that I watched was the one that Mark Hamill... The Path Ahead. The so Path, path ahead. ahead, if you didn't know, Mark um, Hamill comes back to voice Luke during the Empire Strikes Back era. It takes place on Dagobah. It's a training lesson with Yoda, and we find out how Yoda gets on Luke's back. Yeah, yeah. so like basically um, Yoda's got Luke running through the branches uh, of the trees on Dagobah, and he keeps falling out of the branches and everything, and... Um, so Yoda's like, all right, put me in the backpack, and we're going to do this. If you fall, you're probably going to crush me and kill me kind Yoda's, of thing. 
oh! <laughs> and I was like, oh! <laughs> come, come, up we go now. <laughs> so, uh... But I mean, yeah, I mean, I as you know, I'm not a big fan of these forces of destiny. I mean, mm-hmm. they're definitely mm-hmm. geared for uh, the the youngest crowd. Um, I mainly watch this one because I am a fan of Mark Hamill, right. um, and yeah. I kind of felt like he to get him to do something like this, it, there had to be a little bit of substance there. So uh, it gave us a glimpse of what kind of mm-hmm. other training that Luke received uh, with with Yoda on Dagobah. Right, David. I, I kind of like in that one too how Yoda tells him to breathe, breathe, just like yeah. how uh, Luke told Ray that on Octu. So I like how there's, you know, taking the lessons that Luke learned from Yoda. I mean, obviously they're doing it in reverse, but... I think our tone about these eight issues are a little different. I especially hear a difference in tone with Dave, because I know you and I were not on board with the original Forces of Destiny clips. No. But these eight seem to serve an actual purpose of uh, storytelling. Some of them. Whereas I felt the first wave of Forces of Destiny were just like little skits. Mm-hmm. You know, there was no overall benefit but there were some actu- there were some nuggets here. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to go to uh, Bounty Hunted. It was episode six on this, and that's the one where Leia and Chewie are trying to. They're in the earlier stages of breaking into Jabba's palace, and you find out how she gets uh, the the uh, Bosch's armor, mm-hmm. uh, which is the bounty hunter that she walks in as. And it turns out that Maz Kanata actually had a role in that. And you might roll your eyes, but you know what? That's kind of like th- that's this is the can we have cool. now. And it's kind of mm-hmm. cool to see how Maz is kind of recurring theme. She thrusts herself upon Chewbacca, which, I mean, if this is for the kids, you know, that was a little on the nose. Uh, but, you know, it's it's really interesting to see, again, that connectivity and seeing how her role is able to get Leia that armor and how, obviously, that leads up to Return of the Jedi. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I would say that. I, I think there were at least three key things that happened in these Forces of Destiny episodes that change your perspective on current uh, mm-hmm. Lore. The one being, I like you know the path ahead with 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 Luke and Yoda. I mentioned bounty hunted with with Leia and Maz. Unexpected company. Anakin and and Padme are on this. They're going to take this trip or on this mission. They think they're going to have alone time. There's a little awkward flirting, um, and then Ahsoka, Ahsoka walks in up. onto the ship. And by the end of this two minute skit, you see that Ahsoka has. Connected all the dots. Oh, she knows. That Ahsoka, now, yeah. you now know that she knows mm-hmm. that there is something going on between Padme and Anakin. Mm-hmm. And that's not something that we had truly confirmed through the Clone Wars or with mm-hmm. Rebels. Um, so that was, I thought, really, really cool. And it's it's, it's a subtle thing. And if you watch it, you, you learn it, you're great. There's nothing that says you have to go back and rewatch these. But I think that this season two so far serves actual purposes jesse yeah i definitely agree i actually I, uh thumbing through the uh the listing here i did actually watch hasty departure with sabine and hera and okay. chopper mm-hmm. that was a fun uh, one. Th- yeah that wasn't that wasn't bad um i'd say my only complaint about it was it was supposed to be kind of like post uh season uh finale for rebels mm-hmm. um they just seemed a little too chipper it was not <laughs> actually post it really it, it was okay. actually about season two you can tell by the the sabine haircut in that episode okay it's actually a season two, which is a common. Uh, it, that's been throwing a lot of people. It's it's like yeah, that, that, that obviously got me. So. Yeah, it's throwing a lot of people, but no, that's actually about season two because based on Sabine's haircut. But you definitely feel like that was a scene taken out of a Rebels episode. Yeah, right? I, I definitely enjoyed it either way. So. They would take the wrong ship. That would mm-hmm. totally happen. I would and, take the wrong ship. <laughs> and they, just like she opens the door and there's stormtroopers. Yeah, it's like out. that classic yeah. Han runs down the corridor on the death store and runs into the, the garrison <laughs> of troopers. You know. <laughs> the one that did not work for me at all, and I again, I know that we mentioned this before, Jesse made the observation, this is for the kids, and that's fine, but the shuttle shock episode with Rose and Finn. No, that was a waste of time. That to me was just a great example of why I didn't like the character's dynamic in the movie. First, John Boyega does not sound invested at all in this. Mm-mm. He is so flat. He is so calm. Well, I, I Rose is over animated. I even went and looked it up because I thought I heard Boyega was going to be doing the voice and he didn't sound like him. Mm-hmm. So, uh, that it kind of sounded like it was like I love John Boyega. I think he's the greatest Finn. Love his Finn, but he. Well, I, mean, I don't think he wanted to be in this. If, if he's a nerd like we are, then maybe he's just as disappointed as we are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't think we'll be able to get his true thoughts on that until after nine. But uh, uh, good, good point. Run Ray Run didn't really tickle my fancy. Um, that's the one where 
Ray and Tito are in the spaceship trying to salvage, and Tito does something stupid, and Ray has to save him. I thought that was very true to her character, but I don't know. I, I don't think it added anything for me. Jin's trade was a waste of time, where Jin Erso is um, trying to get the kid a fruit. Eventually, I mean, the kid right. steals a copper crystal necklace. And once again, we talked about this with the last season of them. Why are they trying to change Jin's character? She, she, character. She is not selfless. She doesn't have that revelation that maybe I should help other people until half way through her movie yeah um why are they trying to do this to make her out to be a better person that just cheapens the the character growth and you know this didn't happen post rogue one because Mm -hmm. rip um so that's our thoughts on we talk about pork problems we can talk about pork problems because did this work for show the well i want to say you have a pork problem i I do have a pork problem but here's my thing does this work because yep ray literally chases a bird around an island (laughs) with the saber hilt in its mouth yep I'm okay with it. You really? Know, like, if the thing would have, like, you know how that actually ended, David? What? Was the Porg tripped and it activated the lightsaber. Through its head? It. Yeah. Singed its head right off. You're a terrible person. <laughs> there was smoke person. coming from the neck. <laughs> you are the both remnants. awful. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I'm glad you enjoyed it because I... Then Chewie runs up and just takes a big old bite out Listen, of it. Listen, all I'm saying is at the end of that... <laughs> like the deleted was, scene. <laughs> Ray was going to have a Porg cuddle party, and I don't know who's luckier, Ray or the Porgs. I'd say Ray, because I want to cuddle with Porgs. I'd, well, I would pick Daisy Ridley every time, but that's okay. I thought that was a really fun... I, I'm glad we talked about those, and I really enjoyed how much more fun we had with this mm-hmm. conversation. I think we can all agree that this this, this batch of eight is significantly more enjoyable yeah, de- for canon definitely. junkies I agree. than the season one. Let us know what you think. Have you watched all these? If you have not, this is a great time for you to maybe pause the episode and go to beyondtheblastdoors.com. There I've compiled all eight of these uh, shorts, these Forces of Destiny shorts. You can binge watch them right now. Just link them directly from the Disney YouTube channel. So I didn't steal them. I just put them all in one spot for you to enjoy. Let's go on to the next segment, Pages, Pixels, Pieces. We can say for the first time, this segment brought to you by the Fantasy Shop in Maplewood, Missouri. You can find them in the Metropolitan, the St. Louis. It's going to be a great time when you go in there. Comics, board games, just everything that you could want. Good company. You know what I like about, you walk in the place, you hear the Clone Wars theme song. They've got Clone Wars just playing in the shop. Playing on Netflix. It's hanging just, out. It's just delightful. Mm-hmm. It's a great atmosphere. Star Wars 45 just dropped, and uh, I, first off, really intrigued by the cover because it's Luke. And Wedge Antilles looking at a hologram, <laughs> and it just makes me happy. Like it's just, it's like it's just really good art. It, it reminds me of like what Salvo, Salvador La Roca can do. And then when you open up the book, and it's like, oh, I remember what Salvador La Roca could do. <laughs> Not this. Um, it's an interesting story. Again, you know, we're we're dealing with. It's interesting because right now with Star Wars comics, if you're following the Darth Vader line, which we're all fans of here, Vader is on a hunt on Mon Cala. You fast forward to the Star Wars line, which is closer to Empire than A New Hope, mm-hmm. and they're on Mancala trying to get uh, the Calamari to join the Rebellion and the effort. And so right now in Star Wars 45, Leia is trying to create this plan to go rescue Lee Char, who is a leader of the Mon Cala. And it's a character that you know from Star Wars uh, Clone Wars. Mm -hmm. I want to say that Lee Char made an appearance in Rebels, but I don't think that's true. I think he was just in in Clone Wars. If if you know the answer, you can correct me. I I think it was just Clone Wars. David can look it up on his computer if he has time. But Star Wars 45 is a real thrill. And again, it's Leia... Post uh, the last issue where you know she's asked, you know, if 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 you knew that Alderaan was going to get destroyed by the Death Star, would you have joined the rebellion? And we talked about that last. We talked about that two episodes ago. Go and check that out. Um, but I want to get your reaction to this episode, David. If it's okay, we can start with you. Uh, you read this. We know that the art doesn't really work for us, but as far as the story goes, what excited you? So there's a scene at the very end where they're breaking into, I guess it's a prison cell, and there's uh, what I presume to be a Bothan who's kind of decked out as Bail Organa. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Leia just punches him, just (laughs) right in the face. And it's great. You know, my father's dead. (laughs) And, uh, you know... Writing like that, I'm okay with. Um, the art is getting better. The faces still bother me. Mm-hmm. Uh, the story is still not overly grasping my attention, uh, like some of the other ones out there. But um, I, I just like how Leia's... Did we... So is it confirmed in that? Because I, maybe I missed this. It is a Bothan? Oh, I don't think it's confirmed. Okay, so... Are there other shapeshifters that I don't know about? Well, there is the shape... Um, oh my gosh, what was Zam Weasel in Attack of the Clones? 
Oh, oh man, David, look it up. You have the computer. But there yep. are a couple different species that are shape shifters. And again, are Bothans shape shifters? I thought they were just really good spies. I thought they were very elusive. I don't know. Well, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, but. so I, I don't think that could have been a Bothan. Um, whatever Zam Weasel was. Homeworld Zolan. Okay. Species. Species. Claudite. Okay. So maybe a Claudite? Maybe. I guess that's possible. It kind of looked like Zam. A little know. bit. I'll look up Bothan, too, and see what I find All on right. that. Let me, let me know what you think about that. Meanwhile, while you're doing that, Jesse, did you get a chance to read Star Wars 45? No, I mean, as you know, like, it's just, for me, I'm still, I'm starting off easy with the comic books. Darth Vader, um, I'm almost done with, um, from a certain point of view, and mm. then I'm going to tackle the Thrawn novel. Okay. Then I'm going to get into the Thrawn comics. So. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, and that's why I, I really love the group here, because it's like you have different um you know you have just getting started you have was just getting started and now just really deep into the comics and i I like having that variety on our show because i think not everybody has the time to read everything it's okay if you don't have time to read every comic book that's why you watch our show we want to get you up to speed and and let you know so it's a learning experience for everyone so um the star wars wikipedia Mm -hmm. uh, they say that there are changelings or shapeshifters and there's a few different species of them but the only one that they name outright um, are the claudites changeling changeling i'm sorry that's the term that was used in attack of the clones that's what i was thinking of um, that's the uh, term that they use referring to Zam Weasel uh, in the Attack of the Clones after that speeder, that opening speeder chase. Mm-hmm. All right, well, let's go ahead. Um, so, yeah, good issue. Enjoy being on Mon Cala. I think it's a beautiful planet. I think the species are really enjoyable um, because you have the Mon Cala on there, or you have the the, the Mon Cala Mari, and then are the what are the other ones? I'm. It's like the arrowhead uh, with the tentacles. Yeah, yeah they're like the the shark dudes. Not the shark right. dude. Well, kind of. Tyrants. Oh, oh. Uh, help me out here, David. He has a laptop. Quarren. Quarren. There, there we go. There we go. So, and that's really cool because if you watched the micro series, Clone Wars series, back in like 2003, there was a short where there was like a civil war on Mon Cala, where it was the 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 Quarren versus the Calamari, and that's why Kit Fisto had to go with the clone army and and you know have that awesome battle. So, um, which I'm also pretty sure that was a theme. In some of the Clone Wars series. Yes. Subtly. Subtly, but it was mentioned, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Okay, great. So that was Star Wars 45. The other issue we have is Poe Dameron 25 came out. And what's so great about this issue is that it signals the end of an era. And it, and it was, no matter what you say, a very successful 25 issues for Poe Dameron, uh, written by Charles Soule, who also writes Darth Vader. Um, I've talked about it before that you know I, I'm not too invested in the run. But I can appreciate the storytelling that's happening there. Now, I thought they were getting continued past 25 episodes. They are continuing past 25 issues. This was just the end of the chunk this, of it. This chunk. Okay. The next arc is going to start in that Force Awakens Last Jedi era. Okay. So there is going to be a significant time jump in this. And, and Charles Soule has been on Twitter talking about this, elaborating on exactly what this means. And even his writing mm-hmm. process now is where he's writing at issues 26 and beyond. He has the Force Awakens and... The Last Jedi up to kind of give him inspiration because you cannot deny, aside from Claudia Gray, I don't think there is anyone who can connect canon better than Charles Soule. He is able mm-hmm. to pull in a variety of things and trigger memories, and he's just one talented guy. I actually hit him up on Twitter saying so, and he was kind enough to respond. Appreciate that, Charles, if you watch this. Uh, but he's on fire, too, because he's been doing Poe. He's mm-hmm. been doing the Darth Vader series that we all love. Um, he also did the uh, Lando miniseries. Yes. I mean, he is just on fire right now over at Marvel Comics. I'm really excited to see what continues on in this next batch, because I was kind of worried about burnout. But the thing about it is, um, except for the slight hiccup that was number 11, Darth Vader series has crushed in all cylinders. Mm-hmm. I think Poe Dameron gets... Better and here's the thing: you have to like Phil Noto's art is really great. It's like that watercolor art, mm-hmm. and uh, at first it, it took it took me a while to warm up to it. Um, but you know, it, it does grow on you, and the, and the story is there. It, if you want that pre Force Awakens story, and you want, you're craving that kind of canon, this is the run you want to go at because this has really been our only glimpse at. Post Return of the Jedi, pre Force Awakens, mm-hmm. Phasma novel gives you a little bit of it. 
Um, the Phasma comic also gives you a little post Force Awakens, but by and large, this is like your this and Shattered Empire, the the four issue comic series. There are mm-hmm. the only stuff we have right now of that era. So if you're really excited about it, check that out. Uh, David, did you have any thoughts? On Black Squadron in Poe Dameron's number 25? Not particularly. It's not a line that I follow very religiously. I mean, it is it is what it is. I think what was so great about this whole span of 25 issues is this the fact that you get to see Poe as more of a leader. It's more consistent with what you're going to see in Force Awakens when you go mm-hmm. back and rewatch that movie. Um, you get that brash, bold, very gifted starfighter, uh, and you're seeing the development of that character. Um, I don't know if... It supports the Force Awakens Poe a lot more mm-hmm. than the Last Jedi Poe, I think, mm-hmm. um, and and that's just how I see it. But that's uh, number twenty five. Go check that out. Of course, you can get that at your local comic book store. You can pick that up at like our local comic book store, which is the Fantasy Shop in Maplewood, Missouri. Last topic here in Pages Pixels Pieces: Hasbro's Haslab, the the Jabba Sailing Barge. We've been talking about for a few weeks now, getting updates. It's something that Jesse just mentioned about a month ago in in, in staying on target. We've tried to keep up with this. Now we have a video. Of them assembling it and painting yeah, it. It's been quite the journey with this this topic, honestly, because I stumbled upon it trying to get news on new Lego Star Star Wars sets, mm-hmm. and it was mentioned at the, the New York Toy Fair. Mm-hmm. You know, so we kind of dug into it, and you know, was, you know, you mentioned like it's kind of interesting to see how this has developed, um, and now we've actually got images, and I, I'm kind of excited about it because it's. The painting techniques, yeah, I like the, the assembly. It looks really good. It looks like it takes some eternity for them to assemble it. Oh my it. gosh! Um, but I, you know, it'd be a cool shelf piece, as Jesse would say. David, what do you think about it? You know, it's interesting. When I pulled this up earlier today, preparing uh, in preparation for the show, they needed one thousand three hundred and ninety-five more people to submit their five hundred dollars in order for this project to go up. In the last hour and a half, there have been eight more people who have given their money to this project. So they need. Still about 1,400 people in order to get this to go. They say that if they don't get the 5,000 people by April 1st or April something or another, um, that they're going – April 3rd, that they're going to refund all the money and the project's just not going to happen. But if they're already assembling these things and showing painting and doing all that stuff, I, I think at this point they're just going to – send them out to the 3,600 people who've... That's what they should do, because these yeah. people are paying $500. They should get they should get that piece. I mean, obviously, yeah, I mean, there had to been some sort of mold or whatever to assemble these pieces to, to get this together. So, so. They've, they've already spent money, and you know that they're they're not going to give all that back. I just, it just cracks me up, and, and I will respect any fan who's, who's got the financial ability to do this, but you're investing $500 on top of whatever price they set this set to be. Because mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's five hundred dollars. It's five. It's fi- so, so it's an additional five hundred dollars to no, no, buy no. it. No. So they, in order for this project to to move forward, what they're saying is they want five thousand people to commit to the five hundred dollar cost, and then once this project goes through, they will all get their their set with all the other back stuff, and then you can buy the actual kit for three hundred bucks or whatever it is. But if they've got three thousand six hundred and fifteen people times the five hundred bucks, it's four hundred and ninety nine bucks. I mean they've they've already made one million eight hundred and seven thousand five hundred bucks. That's crazy. They're they're keeping the money. They'll 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 give this out. There's no way they're gonna return two million dollars back to well, people. Congratulations to anyone who donated because it sounds like you're going to get Jabba's sailing barge and it looks spectacular. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if it comes with Jabba in it, but that's how they, they showcase it in that video that um, I was talking about. I can look real quick. But it, I don't know. It looks great. I I think I'm crabby about it because I'm jealous that I'm not going to have one, but I don't have the $800 to shell out to get it. Four yeah. foot long vehicle, um, the sail barge, uh, fan accessible decks. 3.75 inch figures not included, allowing fans and collectors to recreate intense battles of the Star Wars saga. It would make me want to get the hot toy Luke Skywalker that's mm-hmm. uh, not out yet, but soon will be. And you, it is Return of the Jedi Luke in the black, and it is they, 200 something dollars, like 225. They, they do get Jabba the Hutt and Yak Face. Oh, you do get that? You get those two, but nothing else. Yak Face. And they would have to be three, oh, okay. the 3.75 figures to fit on the thing? Yep. Okay, well then. Because the hot toy figure is, I think, just shy of a foot tall, so that won't work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's for me. If they were going to, I you would have to get this. I would have to get all the 
various characters that you see. Mm-hmm. For eight hundred dollars, you better give me that. You happy know, meal. like you know, like you'd have to have Slave Leia on there. Be very detailed, Slave Leia. Um, <laughs> Slave Leia. I have a painting of you, Leia. You do. Let oh wait, I'm sorry. The viewer sorry, can't see that. Sorry, yeah. The viewer can't see that. Yep. All right. Well, that's the talk that we have for the Haslab project. Cool concept. We'd be interested to see if they try something different. Maybe they just picked the wrong ship. Maybe fans could get behind something different. Hopefully, it's not another Millennium Falcon because we just have so many Falcons everywhere I look. It's a Falcon here, a Falcon there. Um, and then I do want to mention uh, comic talk real quick before we go to the next segment. Uh, next week, I think is the last week for comics this month for uh, Star Wars. It's the last week in March. Yep. Uh, Dr. Afra. next issue of that drops. That's going to be the final Star Wars comic for the month of March. Stash at our blast is the third segment of our show. Moving right along here on episode 33. So glad to have you with us. First topic here. Uh, Laura Dern says she's open to returning as Vice Admiral Haldo in a future Star Wars project. Uh, I think it was joked about episode 9. So let's first lead with this. Boys. Do we want to see Laura Dern return as J- Admiral Haldo? Just give me Stash or blast it. Jesse. I'm going to blast it. Oh, David. Blast it unless. Oh, my gosh. Unless uh-huh. we get an Admiral Holdo with uh, Joel Edgerton's uh, Owen Lars in a crossover movie. I'd watch that. What's the premise of that movie? I don't know. We can make one up. Is that like your Are you Owen writing? Lars meth dealer thing? Maybe. Is that, is that a teaser that you're writing That's a so fanfic funny. right oh, now? God, no, you, you just don't. like have... Well, that actually doesn't make sense because Holdo is no, no, dead. No, no, it, does, it doesn't need to make sense. Oh, okay. It doesn't need to make sense. Okay, maybe we it's have, like a real we have two origin kids, story we here. We have two actors that we really, really like and they don't need to come back. Now, we know kind of Holdo's origins through the Princess of Leia novel by Claudia Gray, but let's ignore that for a second. And what if... Holdo was a previous lover of Mr. Owen Lars, and uh, they had a falling out, maybe a bad drug deal, and that's what forced her to go towards the rebellion, and she committed suicide as an ultimate escape from the emotional pain and abuse that Owen bestowed, and Baru, you know, she just had to take one for the team. You're not selling me on it. Nope. <laughs> okay. Then if that's the case, then blast it too, because I just don't think that that I don't think Holdo works. No, like I, I love Laura Dern, but yeah, I mean she's a phenomenal a- actress on uh, you know on her own right. Um, her role should have been done by Akbar. I agree with that, and the thing that's interesting too is this just came out that Holdo portrayed in the movie because we've been saying it ever since we read Claudia Gray's novel mm-hmm. does not sync up with the kind of loony. Holdo we get in that novel. I mean, in the novel, you read it, she sounds like these, like she's like sexually interested in a lot of different species, and she's kind of a she's kind of like a space hippie. She's kind of a kind of a hippie of the, mm-hmm. the galaxy, and you get this very stern, dry Holdo, and it turns out that they had tried to do the novel version of Holdo in the movie, and it just wasn't being well received by test audiences, and I guess the hierarchy that is the storytelling group and, and, and Kathleen Kennedy. So they went and they reshot all that with Laura again as a more stoic character. I kind of want to see what it would look like the first time. Uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing like more of the character via right, comics the, or books. I just don't know. Well, I don't know if I agree with that either. The problem with the problem I had with her character in the movie was like you just – she just kind of showed up. She's just like this random person that got control. There's no like, backstory. Right. There's like, no... yeah. you see Akbar and they say, Vice Admiral Holdo, and it's like, who? I, mm-hmm. It just didn't. It's, it's whatever. I, I'm so glad Laura Dern's brought Where, where, where was Galaxy, Holdo though. in Return of the Jedi? Because I knew where Akbar was at and he was right there in the thick of things. Rick in that Okay, so we all have decided that we don't like uh, that idea of Holdo in a future Star Wars project. Great. Here's one that's, I think, a little bit more interesting. We're getting a new report now. Um, that, that the, the two reasons why Colin Trevorrow was fired from Star Wars Episode Nine is that he, in fact, did want Luke to stay alive for Episode Nine, which we have talked about before, but also he was very aggressive in wanting Snoke to be kept alive mm-hmm. for Episode Nine. In this report, uh, it explains that he had several conversations with J.J. Abrams, Ryan Johnson, and Kathleen Kennedy, saying how he wanted there to be more of an origin story for Snoke in Episode Eight. And that would serve a greater purpose in episode nine. And he also wanted to have Luke alive to have a scene with Leia in episode nine. That's where you can start to see where the changes to Trevorrow's script would occur because we lost Princess Leia. We lost Carrie Fisher. So one of those two things could not happen anymore. David, 
you read this article. There is an excerpt in there where they they basically like got in the yelling matches. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah it kind of sounds like it. Um, he, they talk about how Mark Hamill and Colin Trevorrow were on the same page. Um, however, Kennedy and Johnson wanted Luke dead. Period. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, da, 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 da. I you think know, it's he, he wanted Luke to have a walking off into the sunset type thing. Um, and it, the, the article is on to say that uh, rather than Luke dying in eight, um, so they refused for him to live. He argued they fired him. Now, that's interesting to me, Jesse, because we watched the South by Southwest footage where, again, Mark Hamill confirmed he was much on board with Colin Trevorrow's episode nine script. He was happy to see where that character was going. And you know that Mark Hamill views Luke as the one who brought hope and inspired the galaxy. And he was mm-hmm. he was a light that ignited the rebellion and in, in you know yep. uh, a new hope. So if you hear that, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that is I would think what the majority of fans would have wanted to see was this Colin Trevorrow episode nine. If mm-hmm. of course he had these disagreements, it's I I'm happier to know this is the reason behind it. He was passionate about the Star Wars story that mm-hmm. he wanted to tell. If Ryan Johnson gets to be so committed to his story, then I respect Colin Trevorrow to sticking to his guns, and I'm glad it's this, and it's not the success or the lack thereof of Book of Henry. Mm -hmm. It was a movie that came out several months ago in theaters. Less than stellar. It was, it did not meet a lot of expectations, and it was kind of a flop at the box office, and a lot of people assumed that he lost episode nine because of that, Jesse. Mm -hmm. Turns out, he was sticking to his guns. He wanted more uh, Snoke, and he wanted to play with Luke alive. Uh, I definitely think this is plausible. Uh, again, you got to take this stuff with a grain of salt. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, you're, I don't think we're going to get that actual reasoning for maybe probably for quite a few years. I think at least not until at least nine is out. That's a good um, point because it's not confirmed, but it's yeah. heavily suggested based on recent statements by Mark Hamill and, of course, this report coming mm-hmm. out. Um, at the same time, um, yeah, I mean, if he doesn't have very many movie titles on it under his belt, and you know, you mentioned that this book of Henry, I didn't see it; it didn't do well. I would be a little, as somebody, and you know, like business business wise, or you know, I'd be a little concerned about Jurassic World was one of the highest grossing movies of the last however many decades, more than a billion dollars domestically or globally. I mean, it was huge. I mean, here's the thing, though. With with Jurassic World, we it had its flaws, and mm-hmm. we can all admit that. But there are things in there that would have translated really, really well to Star Wars. First of all, the visual effects would have been yeah. great because we have, we've seen that. Um, there would have been lots of nods and throwbacks to the things that we love from the original trilogy. Uh, we see that, uh, that, that we see that with his Jurassic World, um, where we see the park up and running, and he's got the minutia down. He's got the commercialism that you would expect from a theme park. He's got the kitty area where you're riding triceratops. He's got pamphlets and leaflets, and it looked like it was something that you could believe was true yeah. and actually operational. And then he would throw it back to like the shed or the warehouse yep. from the originals. And the old Jeep and yeah. stuff like that and that would have been a very good end to a 40 year old franchise with nine movies to tie it all back together mm-hmm. so it's interesting to me to see this article and that the reason why he was canned is because he didn't like the direction it was going so i mean again plausible mm-hmm. you know i think a little bit of everything there could be i think a mix, a mix here mm-hmm. you know of that you know the book of henry not doing well with um, with the disagreement with uh, keeping Luke and uh, Snow alive. I'm going to go with the disagreement with Kathleen Kennedy being the one that took him out. I don't think it's going to be... I don't think Book of Henry had a factor with it anymore. Kathleen Kennedy doesn't like... I, I don't think she likes to be told no or I don't agree with you. It was mm-hmm. made clear, uh, if, you, if you take this report for what it says, pretty clear that Kathleen Kennedy, J.J. Abrams, they wanted Luke dead. Ryan John wanted him dead. And that's the whole focal point of this episode nine controversy and, and why it's called so divisive is because of that role of Luke. And we're now getting more and more reports that they're like Luke dead. That that was like a priority. Like Luke had to die. And I think when you take these legacy characters and you just we have to get rid of them so we can get our new characters in there so we can make money with the new stories, yeah. I, I think that is a real concern for fans. And I I think that this road to episode nine is going to be very interesting. And I, I hope that the fandom can kind of wash the concerns away and give episode 
a chance at first viewing and, and seeing if it can kind of redeem itself. Because I think fans right now, I think a lot of fans feel the ones that did not like not, 8, they feel like 9 has to earn their respect back. So can I ask you a question here? Go ahead. Are we worried <laughs> with Kathleen Kennedy's leadership at Lucasfilm? I think uh, from a marketing and a business standpoint, I think she is very much a qualified individual in terms of her making story telling um, in, like direction and input. I personally don't think she's qualified for it, at least not for this franchise, even as much as she's been with Lucasfilm and everything. And yes, George Lucas chose her. But, um, I just don't think her talent set is there. Hold that thought. Hold that thought real quick. Real quick. Do you blast it or stash it? The, 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 the Trevorrow fire oh, okay. because of what he wanted to do with Luke. I, you know, I'm going to have to stash it because if, I'm going to say that it, probably 70% of this is probably very much plausible. Okay, and... I'll stash it. Okay, you'll stash it. And then... Okay, so now, because I told you to hold on to it real oh, quick. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. We're going to go to the next segment, and we have the fan com link. Love the fan com link. Again, stash or blast it. Oh. Fun segment, <laughs> but we have fan com link here. And David, can you go ahead and do me a favor? That first fan question we get from uh, Chief Palpy. Sure. What do you think Star Wars would be like if Dave Filoni was the president of Lucasfilm? Do you want me as to... As he star- uh, nailed the Star Wars Rebels season finale. All right, so, okay, so... Do you it, want me to rewind, David? <laughs> in a way, I kind of want you to rewind here. The way it would look like it is this, and, and what Jesse just mentioned in the previous segment I think is spot on, is the fact that from a business standpoint, from a uh, administrative role, I think you can't pick anyone better than Kathleen Kennedy because she has had her hands in the largest franchises of the last four, three, to, <laughs> three to four decades. I mean, I, I think three is probably more accurate. I'm not trying to you know, go over the top here, but she's really been involved a lot, and it's a lot because of her relationship with Spielberg and with George Lucas. Mm-hmm. But from a storytelling perspective, Jesse, I agree with you. I, she's picked to be the business leader. I don't think she was ever picked with the intention of telling stories. Would you agree? Uh, yeah, yeah de- definitely. Uh, I mean, on the flip side of that coin, though, it, from what per, earlier in the, the episode today, we talked about how she kind of forced uh, her hand with uh, the puppet puppeteering for for Yoda and the Last Jedi. Frank Oz is like, you realize how much work, and she's like, it's gonna happen. But I think that's a branding. <laughs> you know? thing. I think that's a branding thing with the fans because she can go over, well, you know, because we have this outcry for practical effects and props. That's something that she used to sell the Poss- movie. Possibly, yeah. But I mean, so I'm not. I'm not trying to discredit. Like, I mean, she's obviously a very talented, very skilled uh, woman. Oh yeah. Um, I I, I, I would w- just say executive. Yeah. Does I, not have anything to do with gender here. I mean, this this is a person that is so far accomplished in it, but administratively, I, I don't think creatively. I, I, I don't think honestly I mean to circle around to the the question at hand though about Filoni I mean we've kind of talked about this the last couple episodes and David I think you are the most equipped uh, clothing wise to really just kind of just do you want to Great give segment. our point T-shirt. all right so Sam Thomas I got to give this guy credit Sam Thomas is like a digital teacher on on the internet and I don't know if this is going to show well on the camera I'll, I'll maybe take a photo I think kinda, it's work. But on this thing, it says, it says Filoni on my right breast here. It says Filoni should write all Star Wars stories. And I would agree with that. I would agree. With that. Also, Sam Thomas, great shirt. Find him on Twitter. He'll link you up to his Public account, and you can get a shirt like this, or you can get the traditional, like, Filoni, a Star Wars story. Like <laughs> it's, it's, it's a black shirt. It looks really good. Um, but go check him out on the internet. Um, I, I, I think that's where I'm at, is the fact yeah. that I think that she should be in charge of promotion, the business side of things, and let Dave Filoni helm all the storytelling stuff. I don't agree that he should be president of Lucasfilm. No. Uh, because he doesn't know that. He Clearly, Kathleen Kennedy knows how to promote and, and, and build suspense for a franchise and, and, and to produce that franchise. Dave Filoni is a storyteller. So you give him control... He, he is the king of the storytelling group. You give him the keys to all the stories, and he can organize all, uh, all the candy. You, do you agree, disagree? I agree. You, you're, you're, yeah. you, you can roll with this? Yeah. Because you've kind of gotten it. You've, got, you've, you've watched all of Star Wars Clone Wars. You're getting caught up on Rebels. You're experiencing his storytelling. It is consistent with I would say it's more Lucas consistent Star Wars. now than it was the first two episodes of the Clone Wars, which okay, I that's... didn't particularly care for. And that's kind, of, the... kind of a snowball effect, yeah. you would say. But his but storytelling. It, it takes time to get into it. You got to find your audience. I can get that. Yeah, I think with, I I've said it several times. 
I think what fans really want, whether they'll admit or not, for the saga films, is they wanted George Lucas's vision for seven, eight, and nine. They wanted George Lucas written stories with a system of check and balances, okay, and then a different director to come in and bring that to life on screen. I think that's what we ultimately want. Dave Filoni is like George Lucas writing, but with checks and balances, without crappy lines for romance. Dave Filoni somehow managed to not lead a revolt of Star Wars fandom by introducing this concept that there is time that Jedi can tap into and like jump around the timeline. Like that's a thing now. And you don't have a revol- now, I think if Ryan Johnson would have done that on screen I think it would have been terrible. I think it would have been I think fans would have hated it. Uh, but somehow Filoni made it work. And that's just one example. Um, and he also gave us Ahsoka Tano. So um, I think to answer this question, I think it's a cool idea. But I think realistically, Kathleen Kennedy needs to be still executive in charge. But Dave Filoni definitely, he was always set up as the heir apparent uh, to the storytelling. And it's just a damn shame that he isn't getting those opportunities. And hopefully with this um, John Favreau TV series for the streaming service for next year, I'm hoping that's where we see Dave Filoni get some um, additional opportunity. Uh, I believe it was... In a tweet, Filoni said that we are getting an announcement soon. Yes, we are. We just don't know what it is. We just don't know what it is, but we are. Something is coming soon. I would theorize May the fourth. Maybe. I mean, we did talk about it a couple weeks ago. I remember David bringing up that Star Wars Resistance had been copyrighted or yep. something or trademarked by Lucasfilm. We don't have that confirmed as the next. You know, we don't have that confirmed as the next series, but uh, Dave Filoni has confirmed on social media. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, that a series is announcement is on the way. The next question we have in the fan com link is from uh, John Boffman, great guy. He is a Patreon supporter, fan of the show, and uh, he's the responsible one for these gifts on the table. And let's go ahead and take a look at it. How is it possible you guys don't like the music? I think I, I know where this is going. He's going for the, for the uh, solo trailer. Solo trailer, yeah. He corners me all the time about how I don't like it. Have you just stopped and really listened to that bass riff? Seriously, how do you guys think they'll be able to balance Lando from Solo, Rebels, and the OT? I think that's the most interesting dynamic of all the promotional materials that we've seen because Lando steals your eye before Han. Mm-hmm. I have read some stories on the internet from um, like like fan critics and pundits that have people on the inside that have seen parts of the solo movie, and all they are describing it as, as good things. But there is positive th- there is positive vibes being sent out from Lucasfilm about the solo movie, which well, is exciting. That's great. They need to market that. Okay, yeah, I would agree with that because like three months ago, I'm curious to see how they balance Lando with Han in this movie because I think there's more hype to see. Uh, Donald Glover's performance than all Aaron Reichs. Again, I don't think we're going to get any more trailers. I mentioned this last episode simply because that I think it would give too much of the plot and story. I guess uh, some TV spots coming out. You know, but um, yeah, I mean, if early viewings and everything, I do think they'd up up the flare a little bit. Get it, get me more excited for this movie. Um, in terms of the first part of this question about the music. Uh, for me, it reminded me of, uh, it was a George Lucas uh, movie, uh, World War II movie. What was that? Oh, the... Uh, Red, Red, Red Tails? Red, Red Tails, yeah. And they did dubstep to a World War II movie. Nope. Okay, yeah. like... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> mm, nope. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't quite work, does Nope. It? Okay, so like, I mean, no, this isn't exactly on the same extreme, you know, kind of thing, but it kind of had that vibe, and that did kind of throw me off. Okay. So, I mean, if they can... I don't think the whole movie's going to be that way, so, you know, I like any Star Wars movie, I actually do sit down and listen to the whole soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I definitely want to listen to the soundtrack, you know, I, just to see, you know, how it, how it flows. And we know that John Williams is involved with this movie. He's doing the actual theme for, like, Han Solo, the character, mm-hmm. the character theme. Yeah, but he's so, not doing the rest of it. Correct. Just the solo theme. Right. But you know that there... If you have John Williams involved with the movie, you're going to get a traditional classical theme. You're not going to get him doing a synth theme. And then I would argue, then, why did they give me a trailer music that I would expect to hear out of Blade Runner? Well, you know, they just really haven't... The promotions hasn't been strong the entire time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I hold hope, damn it, because it's Han Solo. Uh, the, the next part of this question is, is how how do we think that they're going to balance Lando from Solo, Rebels, and um, the original trilogy? Mm-hmm. 
Um, so you basically what he's asking is like, you know, we get this character out of solo. He does make an appearance, uh, two times, two different times in rebels. Really? Spoilers. I should be caught <sighs> up. I'm sorry. You should be. I'm a little ashamed. <laughs> Thanks right for the now. question, John. Appreciate that. <laughs> and the original trilogy. <laughs> um, you know, as long as it's kind of like consistent growth kind of thing. So you get, we're obviously getting a younger Lando. We have a little bit of an older uh, Lando, uh, pre New Hope Lando. Um, I think there, I would think what he's referring to is the balance on screen. Like, how are you going to keep this movie from becoming really Lando a Star Wars story instead of Solo a Star Wars story? Which was oh, okay. what I was trying to get to at the beginning of this, which is I think one you got to limit on screen time, and you got to make sure that Alden's Han Solo is really compelling. I think the scene that gives me the most encouragement out of the tra- teaser trailer is that at the very end, he's like um, talking, you know, he's reacting to flying through the space squid or whatever that is, and he's like, I thought we were in trouble. But everything's okay. Everything's all right, or whatever that line is. Um, you know, that seemed to me like a brash young solo, you know, flying from the seat of his pants, and that's and that's solo. So mm-hmm. I, I think for me, it's going to be balance of time on camera. I think we're actually going to get quite a bit of Lando. I think that I'm sure that when they were going through the video, the, the movie the first time, they had, they identified that Donald Glover was working as Lando, and they probably gave him gave him some ability to, to 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 play around. I look forward to that scene with Sabak. That's what I want to see. David, I I, I haven't seen Lando and Rebels, so I can't really testify to that one we know what you're staying on targets gonna be yeah i i, I just don't want to get confused here i really think what he's asking here is are you afraid that lando will outshine han solo in the movie i would be okay if lando outshined han solo in the movie okay I well then be. there we go mm-hmm. there we go all right well that's a fan comic we tapped it pretty well today hit in all the right spots uh before we go to the last segment which is staying on target i, I guess we should open up these gifts i mean is that is that fair the, the fan comic so. yep. we so again sheaf Thanks for joining our Patreon this past week, donating at the $20 level. That is going to allow us to do some really cool things Mm -hmm. uh, with our show. We thank you for that monthly commitment. John, you're a Patreon supporter as well, and you you guys send in these questions, you send us gifts, and I have a box. This is really cool. So let's open them up. And uh, Jesse, uh, Jesse, just rip into it. Just rip into it. Don't don't take a lot of time. Just go into it. What's the, what's the message on there? Okay, so this says, for Jesse, because I thought you had to have it. Okay, rip it open, baby. Go for it. This is, oh yeah, we're going to hear the ripping. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shut up. There we go. That is awesome. A Boba Fett backpack. I get a Facebook message one day from Johnny. He's like, "You think Jesse would like this?" I'm like, "Oh yeah." <laughs> what do you? You have to like. You have to use that now. Yeah, you I mean, have uh, to do that. It's got, oh, it's got uh, like the back on. It's actually kind of like a hard shell. Yeah. Uh, that's actually kind of convenient. I mean. It, like transporting, like maybe, you know, blasters or something. Or your anything cosplay like, stuff. Yeah. Your cosplay kit now. Yeah, because uh, it, it, I mean, if you, I don't know how. Would it, wearing that on your back, walking around a comic con, get you into the five o first? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, thanks, John. Uh, this actually, yeah, this was. Uh, it's pretty decent. This is a pretty large backpack, actually. Uh, yeah, it's it's padded on the back, so yeah, I actually already have have a use for it, so it's. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's so fun when, like, you know, you're doing the show and, like, people, like, they're... They you know, watch, we, they care. Yeah, you watch. They enjoy you, it. You care? We're yeah, doing something like, right. Wow. That's cool. Like, do you want me to go or do you want to go? Uh, I can go next. You go next. You're in the middle of the table. Nice little symmetry there. I like the paper, too. It's um. It's going to be the complete ser- uh, season. Pops with a uh, Orson Krennic. Oh! Ooh. Oh my it. gosh! Look at that. Here, here. I'll, you want me to hold it? Oh, up? you for, you don't like the pops. things yet unfinished. So I presume there's something with rebels coming there, um, and uh, uh, Finn because he says that uh, because I know you respect his bravery. You're full of shit, John. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. Well, that's the... I, I do like I do like Finn. <laughs> that's the one swear. That's that's yeah. how we're keeping it PG. All right, cool. <laughs> well, those are really cool. And I wonder I wonder what he means about Krennic. Is that about your Lego shuttle? Like you still have to finish the Lego shuttle? Maybe, well, that's possibly. That's it. probably so what it is. Possibly. Like what are you gonna make? But you also don't like Legos pop with? vinyls, do you? Yeah, you know. <laughs> All right, looks like Krennic. I can handle a Krennic. Looks like I got some figures going here. Ooh. Oh my gosh, I got a Shore Trooper. Oh my gosh, this is, looks awesome. So I got the the Shore Trooper, the pop figure there. That's gonna have to go on I set. I'm gonna go ahead and put it right there. I like the Shore Troopers. I thought they were a, a cool uh, trooper variant. Oh my gosh, really great variant of the, yeah. of the trooper armor, uh, and a great addition for the Rogue One gallery. And then Captain Phasmo, look at this baddie. For what could have been, that is awesome. 
That is so <laughs> great. Literally. He says on the case, so it's it's Phasma, right? For what could have been. You're damn right. What could have been with this character? So underutilized. John, thank you so much for all these gifts. That's awesome. We're yeah. being a little selfish and opening these up, but we felt like if you're going to give us these uh, for the show, that we should open them up here. So well, I got, I got a thank you card for us to send to him, and I figure we'll wait until he gets to his uh, new place of living, and we can be his first mail, and hopefully... Hopefully we can beat that. Heck yeah, bills. man! Heck and yeah. and uh, you know, sorry to see that you're moving out of the area, but uh, glad that you won't be too far away, and then we'll still be able to stay in touch, especially through the show. So, uh, when you're in sunny Florida, you be sure to share our show. That's awesome. That that is awesome. This thank is, thank you again, John. Had no idea that this sh- the the show would mean this much to anybody. I thought we were just doing this because we were like, you know, yeah. we're all we had for each other thank let's you. go thank you all let's go ahead and jump into staying on target the last segment for our show this week and uh i'm i'm kind of in all right now because of what just happened like i th- that generosity is just really overflowing yeah um so i guess my staying on target is honestly just finding a good purpose for captain phasma and my short trooper. maybe there's a diorama where i can have my short trooper aim taking aim at captain phasma, phasma. Mm-hmm. um but uh no they're I, I just john really appreciate that uh jesse let's start with you staying on target uh well i mean we got easter uh, next weekend. So for me, it's family stuff. Um, I'm going to be cooking. You uh, cook? You I, cook? Yeah, I, I had to take over the cooking for, you know. Oh, are you a good cook? Like, I'm actually a, a pretty fantastic pockets. cook. Or, like it's edible? Yeah, like edible. Oh, my God. What do you make? I can make just about anything. Roast chicken, turkey, homemade stuffing. Oh, my God. I'm learning really? about you. This is great. I'm oh. actually a fantastic cook. Okay, so. well, let's not get cocky, <laughs> kid. Let's... Don't get cocky, kid. Um, so, I mean, yeah, obviously that. Um, obviously, I'm also just trying to figure out some time to relax, you know, the usual stuff that I work on. So, you know, and I actually got some crap on a, a fan comment. I don't know if you caught it. Not really crap, more of a, a troll or a tease. I, I think a tease. I don't uh, think you know, somebody, uh, I think maybe when we get warmer weather. This would go great for a lightsaber hilt prop building. They want to see the hilt video. I don't think that's a yeah, problem. But they also want a field trip to the shop. No, they seriously want that. That would be a genuine <laughs> I, thing. I don't have really what? an actual shop. Why are you being a jerk about this? People actually care about your cosplay. <laughs> no, as much I as you have to hear about it, I'm glad someone out there fucking cares. Oh, gonna... the F word. Oh, gosh. We, we, can, we can bleep. We, bleep? Do we, do we, we, we can, can add bleeps? a bleep in there. Yeah, we can bleep it out. We can bleep. No, I mean, uh, again, it's just, it's fantastic, you know, people's excitement just for the things that we do on the show and everything. Um, no, I, I think that'd be kind of cool. Um, we, we'll get in touch and we'll figure that out. Um, Even if it's just your shed, we'll get some brews and we'll just build. It's a very open, open door. Right? It's, it's like when you were a kid and you were like, teacher, can we have class outside? That's kind of how my... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my shop is it's uh i just kind of set a table up out in the you know yard Backyard. and can you imagine what the neighbors think they're like <laughs> the buck kids out in the front lawn again oh my gosh like you know Playing with a fire torch <laughs> when i was like cutting the helmet out and everything or working on blasters and stuff like that i'm like i'm just waiting for like the cops to like roll up to see what i'm doing kind of thing because i mean like i'm making all this noise you know we got some elderly neighbors I'm covered in a white fine powder, too. So, I mean, there was that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, uh, cosplay is uh, can be, you can be clean about some things, but it gets really messy at other times. Also, so. can be mistaken for producing drugs, I guess. <laughs> That's yeah. interesting. David, what's, what's your staying on target? Well, last, uh, I guess two weeks ago, because I missed last week, my staying on target was to watch Rebels, mm-hmm. and I did not watch any Rebels. Great. Um, mm-hmm. I got distracted with Jessica Jones. So, uh, put that on the list. But more Shame importantly, you. Uh, down at the Maplewood Comic Book Shop, picked up Thrawn number two. Yes. And I'm about halfway through that. Mm-hmm. And uh, picked up another box, uh, short box, to get the rest of my comics in. So, getting the rest of my comics and mylar so anyone who who collects comic books uh david has graduated from his first short box to his second short box it's your fault and we the way the path that he's on right now he might have to buy a long box before this is all said and done to I, throw some books out. i don't have a problem uh he <laughs> i feel like you're, you're david's darth kermit oh i'm totally darth, darth kermit i'm totally being the the influence here i think it's great um yeah for for my sake on target we'll just I just want to see what we do with, with the gifts that we got from John, and I want to see what we do with the show here. Really, this is the thing on Target. I, I can't wait to see what happens next week with uh, the Fantasy Shop. Mm-hmm. Again, at the beginning of the episode, we announced that they're now the official sponsor of our show. Um, we also have news that following the nerd, you can find them on uh, all social media. They have asked us to, to to promote on their website, and so following the nerd is now uh, helping stream our episodes. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So it, it's just really cool to see 
uh, this take off. You know, we're about to we're about to hit a year here. Are we the in late April? Spark the ignites the rebellion, Dave. No, we're not. Did you? <laughs> Star Wars Facebook page posted the quote. It's like we'll be the spark that'll be the light that'll whatever whatever Poe says. And I was just like, man, this is terrible writing. Who would put that'll in twice in a sentence? Um, but no, I'm really excited to see how this works with the fantasy shop and get that first, get those comics away next week. And then we'll have following the nerd who's helping us uh, promote the episode. So real quick, we learned something about Mark Hamill actually from this past weekend. What was that? He prefers green milk. He prefers green milk. Yes. I tweeted to him and he responded that he preferred green Green milk. milk. Oh, that's right. Which is frustrating because that comes from that weird thing's breast, and that was like the worst. At the same ever. time, I think Mark Hamill trolled me because I tweeted this out at like two in the morning, which would have been technically St. Patty's. We know that Mark spent time in Ireland, yeah. Uh, so it was probably already full blown St. Patty's day. Do you think that Mark Hamill drunk tweeted you? I think possibly, or you know, <laughs> uh, but all the same, I'm super just excited about it. Like it was just like all I said was green things, and I'm like. Well, like it's just like oh, I had the best day Saturday because of it. I think he's so excited. I think that's green milk. I feel on my foot right now. So that's when I do it for episode 33 of Beyond the Blast Stories. Thank you so much for joining us. If you haven't already, find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, BeyondTheBlastStories.com, Patreon. We're in all these places that we want you to be a part of, so that you're a part of our Star Wars conversation. We've had three people request that we start a a Beyond the Blast Stories Discord, so that is in the developments as well. So if you want to be a part of that, I think Jesse would be able to help us with that, and uh, you can be part of the conversation there as well, gentlemen. It was an absolute blast. Mm-hmm. Was it Beyond the Blast? I guess it was that exciting. <laughs> we'll see you next week. <laughs> If you haven't already, go ahead and smash that subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. You can watch other videos just like this one right now by checking out these videos on your screen. And by the way, thanks for checking out Beyond the Blast Doors.